All right, let's get things started. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone from wherever you are. Uh, and welcome to this month's um, webinar uh, that is hosted by the Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention here at Binghamton University at the State University of New York in the United States. Uh, and for this month's uh, webinar, we're very delighted to uh, welcome our co-host for this event, the, the staff at the uh, Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace and Security located in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, we, uh, we're, we're delighted to have you here with us. We have an extremely interesting group uh, and topic for you, and we're looking forward to a great conversation. Uh, Binghamton University, where we're coming to you from today, sits on the ancestral land of the Oneida and Onondaga peoples. So let me first take a few minutes to do the, uh, some, um, uh, some technical stuff with you to make sure that uh, you're, we're all ready, and then I will introduce our, our four panelists today. Um, we are offering today's webinar with simultaneous English-Spanish interpretation. So if you look at the bottom uh, uh, of your screen at the, at the tool menu, if you go to the far right, you will see a, a, a translation feature that looks like a little globe. Um, if you want to hear uh, today's um, uh, webinar in English, can you please click on that globe and it will give you a menu that chooses between English and Spanish. You will then click on the English and then the globe will become a little uh, circle that says EN in it. And then you will hear everything that everybody says in the English language. Uh, if on the other hand, you would like to hear it in Spanish, uh, obviously click on the, the same globe icon and then choose Spanish. Uh, and then you will hear everything in Spanish. If you are bilingual and prefer to hear everybody speak in their original languages, simply don't activate uh, the interpretation function. Um, uh, so once that is set, uh, we will be having two hours of conversation uh, today with our four panelists, um, who I will introduce to you in a moment. Uh, we welcome uh, questions from you, from the audience um, who joined us today. Please submit your questions at any time uh, during the, the session using the Q&A function, which is the second to farthest to the right um, icon uh, at the bottom of your screen. When you type in your question, um, please um, keep your question as, as succinct as possible. And uh, uh, please, uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, um, at the end of your question, indicate uh, your name and if appropriate, your affiliation so that we, we know who you are. We uh, try to get to as many of your audience questions as we possibly can. We usually begin going through those questions in the second hour uh, of our meeting. Um, uh, if we can't get to your questions, we will sometimes bundle questions together if we think that they're similar enough to, to do so. If we don't get to them, to them at all, uh, uh, we, we will try to forward uh, the unaddressed questions at the end of the session to our panelists and uh, ask them, uh, if they if they can if they can um, uh, get back to you so um, uh, you you may also for that reason uh, um, um, be getting um, uh, contacted by us at, uh, in the follow up to the session um, today's um, session is on prioritizing children in uh, atrocity prevention um, preventing the recruitment uh, and use of children by armed forces and armed groups and as, as well as criminal networks and gangs and reintegrating former child soldiers in the aftermath of armed conflict are all profound uh, challenges for atrocity prevention. In conflicts around the globe, children are used in a variety of roles, uh, ranging from combatants to support functions, uh, as sexual slaves, human uh, bombs, intelligence gatherers. And as a result of these, they face uh, uh, a devastating range of physical, psychological, and social vulnerabilities. We've learned that successful reintegration of children after such experience is profoundly challenging and is even more made even more so by the instability that is so typical post-conflict societies. And this in turn significantly contributes to a heightened risk of further cycles of violence and to the recurrence of atrocity crimes. Finding better ways to protect children from recruitment in the first place uh, as well as their use 
uh, in uh, uh, armed groups and finding better ways to reintegrate children who have previously been recruited has to be prioritized for achieving more peaceful and just societies. In this webinar, we're going to uh, explore these topics, but we're also going to ask what prevention approaches uh, hold the most promise for reducing the recruitment and use of children as soldiers? And more specifically, what do these prevention efforts in the context of armed forces and armed groups have in common with parallel efforts in the context of criminal networks and gangs? How can lessons learned from interstate or interstate armed conflict inform efforts to reduce recruitment into organized criminal networks and gangs and vice versa? To explore these topics and more, we're delighted to welcome our four panelists who are joining us from all around the world. Uh, let me introduce them in no particular order. Um, First, Achilleche Christian Leke is a civil society uh, and peace building activist. He has special expertise in youth issues. He is national coordinator of youth, uh, local youth corner Cameroon, and he joins us today from Cameroon. Uh, Achilleche, welcome. It's delightful to have you with us. Cesar Rincon is a Colombian lawyer with 30 years of experience in criminal investigation. Uh, focusing on criminal organizations, human rights violations, and government corruption. His experience includes 11 years as team coordinator at the United Nations International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala. Uh, Cesar, thank you for joining us today. Stephen Dudley is an investigative journalist, policy analyst, and author. He is co-founder and co-director of Insight Crime, a think tank focused on organized crime in the Americas. He is the author of many books. His most recent book from last year, from, or from 2019, excuse me, is MS-13, The Making of America's Most Notorious Gang. Steve, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. And finally, Shelley Whitman, uh, uh, the co-host of today's event, is the executive director of the Delaire Institute for Children, Peace, and Security. Uh, joining us from um, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Shelley, it's great to have you with us. Thank you so much uh, for having me as well and for agreeing to co-host this uh, important event today. You're very welcome. And, and Shelley, I'd like to start with you. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's hard sometimes for those of us uh, 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 not doing this specialized kind of work to, to wrap our minds around the sheer scale and complexity of the problem. Can you set the stage for us with a little context what is the what, what are the numbers uh, uh, and uh, that you that you're seeing of, uh, of children who have been or are being recruited actively into armed conflict around the world and how have those numbers been been changing over the last few years? So one of the greatest challenges that we have in the data on this issue is that there isn't really a good international estimate of the numbers of children who are recruited in use around the world. So um, that is, is one hard thing for us to quantify the numbers of children. But what we can tell you is this, that every year the United Nations through the Secretary General and the Office of the Special Representative to the Secretary General in Children in Armed Conflict releases a list which shows the countries um, the state forces as well as the non-state uh, armed groups that are recruiting and using children around the world. And it demonstrates these six grave violations that are being committed against children. So what we know is that we have 54 uh, non-state armed actors around the globe who are recruiting and using children or committing violations against children. And then we have another state, our um, seven state armed um, uh, forces that are still recruiting and using children. So if you think about how many groups, and I would also say that um, another factor for us to think about is uh, the number of armed conflicts. So if you look at any of the armed conflicts that are any of the major armed conflicts that are going on today, or any, any of the potentials that are emerging, like when we talk about Cameroon, it's a great example, which is great that we have Ekeleki here with us today, is that um, in any of those contexts, you can see the recruitment and use of children is either at its early stages or is full blown in many of those contexts, or you have children who could potentially be brought into the conflict. So 
the magnitude and the scope of this issue is actually huge. And just to follow up um, a, a little bit with that, um, uh, your organization, the Delaire Institute, has uh, has really taken a lead in in I guess I would put it this way, trying to change the conversation from a, a very heavy focus on reintegration, which is of course an extraordinarily important and and uh, 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 aspect of the problem, uh, to to more um, uh, a more of a focus on prevention of recruitment. Um, can, can you address for us just very briefly before we turn to the other panelists? First of all, why do you think that, that the reintegration of child soldiers has, has dominated the, the conversation in, in, uh, in the way that it has? And what's, what's to be gained? What's, to, what's the rationale for trying to pivot that conversation more toward upstream or, pre, or prevention of recruitment? Yeah, great question. Um, absolutely, reintegration is very important, right? Once children go through these types of incidences that occur, we, we always want to provide support to them and to the communities. But it's just putting a Band-Aid on, on, a, on a cut instead of really addressing what's at the core in terms of prevention. And, and that prevention is far better than cure. So what I would argue from my knowledge of working in this field and on these issues for, for many years now, is that generally, when it comes to conflict prevention, the world always goes towards um, reacting after the fact, as opposed to putting in the work beforehand in the prevention element. So that's one part of it. The other thing is, is that we had a period in the 90s where you had some pretty prolific cases that also got known to the world, like the Lord's Resistance Army out of northern Uganda, um, through, you know, some pretty successful campaigning by some organizations. And I think that uh, when people put money and effort into rehabilitation, they see it as tangible. Prevention isn't tangible. It's always hard to measure what you have prevented from happening in the future, although it makes sense to all of us, right? So I would say to everybody, it makes sense for us to teach our children about behaviors or um, habits that are negative for them, like smoking, like uh, aspects that could lead to teen pregnancy, etc. cetera. We, we, we talk to them about those things because it makes sense, but we can't always measure adequately what we've prevented. And so that's a, a part of the dynamic that's really hard. But the shift is that what we're seeing is that so much of the effort in terms of money and resources, et cetera, to address things such as rehabilitation have not led to a prevention in the future in those situations. And I can talk to you, you know, about conflicts like South Sudan and other places that we're currently involved in. You see cycles of child soldier recruitment and use every time a new conflict um, occurs. So really important for us is to understand that prevention is hard, but it's necessary if we wanna to get to the point where we actually see a reduction in the numbers. Thank you. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn things over uh, to my co-director of the Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention here, uh, Nadia Rubai. Thanks, Max. And thanks, Shelley, for providing that, that broad overall context. Um, I'd actually like to direct the next question to Akaleke, because before we go too far down the path of um, the data and the strategies and talking about prevention and reintegration and rehabilitation, I think it's also important that we have um, a more personal um, story um, to, to understand the nature of, of the problem and the severity of the problem. And I think it would be helpful um, if you could provide a little bit of your background so that people could understand what we're really talking about here. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Nadia. And uh, it's really great joining this conversation. And uh, personally, um, when, when, I was, when I was reached out to around these uh, uh, personal grew from a uh, growing in the context of gang violence, uh, uh, which had been the order of the day. And, uh, you know, growing up, growing up was the key. key 
it at the age uh, issue of gang violence was very common. And growing up in that context, it was you know the best thing that most of us could do. And uh, and reflecting on these every time in the kind of work I do, I, I see a big connection to it because the same issues which uh, pushed many young people um, into uh, violence and crime at this level are the same things which we are seeing today, especially in violent extremist groups and in armed conflict situation. As a young person, uh, I grew up seeing how, you know, because of uh, peer pressure, a young person can identify he saw himself uh, to a group of friends, you know, to protect themselves or be ready to, to you know, pay back if one of them is hurt. And I did not hear about this. I did not read about it. It's something I lived and I saw on hand. And I could see how a young person uh, who, a child, you know, uh, 15, 14, who uh, did not know a lot about good or bad, for example, could do something really wrong thinking that he's doing right. You know, because at the same time, while you, you have the peer pressure, at the same time, uh, you are, your society makes you feel what you're doing is right. Because you could see situations where the most violent and the most radical were the ones who were most talked off in the community. And, and sometimes even parents will resort to, you know, fighting or violence as a way to solve their own problems. I mean, this was really, really, you know, touching because uh, I had experience where my own close peers, you know, uh, either killed or you know, thrown to jail. And uh, the, the reality of this was quite clear uh, that, you know, as a child, there is a need for us to be protected and prevented from, uh, uh, you know, falling prey to this. And uh, this is what actually really inspired my work as a person. And for the past 14 years, uh, where I saw a different perspective, you know, of living uh, in a space where people could think differently. Uh, when I when when I turned seventeen, uh, my parents, you know, had to send me to a boarding school as a way to prevent me from that in a different city. And when I went to this different city, I remembered in school there were several instances in the boarding school where I wanted to resort to, you know, violence if someone hurts me. Um, but I realized that I was on my own. You know, people could do things differently. And I realized that, you know, people could forgive, you know, people could let go. And whereas the way we grew up in our neighborhood, it was like, okay, you know, if someone hurts you, you need to hurt the person back. I mean, so I had to learn these values from a very hard way because at the same time, where I grew up from was a stigma. You know, sometimes when you mention that you are from this city, uh, they know you're either violent or you do things very wrongly. I mean, the stigma that comes with it, it's very difficult for a child to, to really deal with it, you know? And sometimes it's not just about trying to solve it when it has happened, maybe by providing an alternative or trying to do reintegration programs, but the stigma with it, you need to fight it so hard and you have to be very consistent. I think that's what has really informed uh, my work. And, and that's why I, I, I took this topic very, very personal because if I want to share this experience, I would share and share and sometimes become very much more emotional uh, because um, when I go to prisons now, you know, working in prisons across the country, uh, when I went to the prison in my, my neighborhood, 60% of those who are there are my peers, are my friends, and, and we knew each other, you know, growing up. And, you know, and that's why I've been working very hard to see how we can prevent, you know, children from having such exposure and, and seeing how those who have been part of the process are given perfect alternative and made understand that, you know, um, these are just the realities of where sometimes people grow up. Okay, And thank you. Uh, we need thank to be consistent you. about it. So it's more of that, thank you. Thank you, Kristen. On, on that note, I mean, let me just um, uh, broaden the, the conversation a little bit here. I mean, we're using the term uh, recruitment and it's the, the idea of recruitment that we're trying to that we're trying to um, prevent, presumably. Um, that's a tricky word because as we know, there's many, many pathways that children um, 
uh, that children are taking into armed groups, whether they're um, uh, 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 armed groups in the context of armed conflict or of gangs. I mean, it ranges all the way from physical kidnapping, which was the, the classic form of recruitment, I guess you could say, in the LRA in Northern Uganda, all the way to um, uh, various other kinds of pathways. And so one of the things I was interested in, in having maybe Steve Dudley uh, and, and Shelley Whitman talk about is how, are, how should we think about these very uh, multiple pathways into these groups? They're children, obviously, so they don't have the kind of ability to consent, um, either in the legal or in the moral sense that you and I would normally think of. Uh, nevertheless, there seems to me to be big differences between a child who's literally kidnapped uh, versus one who, um, on whatever level, uh, is drawn into a certain kind of life um, for, for other reasons. How, help us think about uh, that range of, 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 of phenomena that we mean by the idea of recruitment. Shelley, go, go ahead. I can jump in after. Are you sure? I'm uh, yes. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so maybe I'll uh, speak more from the theoretical to the practical dynamic of it. And Steve can jump in and give his experience, uh, his specific experience of his working with gangs. But just to understand, yeah, you're right, Max, there are multiple pathways in which children can become associated with an armed force or an armed group or an armed gang or a criminal network. Yet there are the instances where they may be um, abducted or kidnapped, um, but there are also the instances where they have become um, victims of being displaced. Um, many children, when people are fleeing conflict zones, get displaced from their children in, in such instances. I can recall many cases of mothers saying in the heat of battle, they fled their homes and picked up a package, which they thought was a baby, uh, but only to get to the place that they get to, to realize that what they had was a sack of potatoes or something else from their home because of the madness of, of fleeing. So displacement um, aspects also related to children who lose their parents and their families as a result of, of being killed during war. And so um, thinking through all of these things, sometimes it's a sense of uh, a needing of a protection, uh, self-defense. Um, it might be that's the only pathway for you to be able to survive, to get food. And sometimes, actually, there are also cases where uh, families will um, take children to um, to armed groups or forces because it's a payment for protection or because um, it might even be viewed as a pathway of hope for that family. I, I know of places where children have been marched to armed groups with their mother singing because they're thinking that their child is going to get an education. That was the promise that they were given. So all of these dynamics, it's very complicated to understand and you can only understand it if you're in the midst of desperation. Um, and so what becomes normalized around you too, and I think this is where Steve's work will be really important to hear, is the normalization of of violence and the socialization of that also is something that's very important to recognize about how children become associated. But the only other point, Max, that I wanted to just quickly say on this is that it actually, the way in which children become associated with the groups shouldn't be our focus. Our focus should actually be the fact that the adults who create these groups and these opportunities need to be stopped from doing that because children can't always make long-term decisions and they don't know the consequences of their actions. It's the very nature of the way that the brain develops. So this is an important factor for us to recognize too in terms of prevention. Thank you. Uh, thank you um, again to the University of Binghamton and uh, Dallaire Institute for inviting me and being part of this panel. Um, I, I have researched um, both the, the street gang element, which is my most recent book uh, via the, the case of the MS-13, but also insurgent groups in, in, in Colombia. Uh, 
and also Guatemala. So I've seen different ways in which youth are drawn in. I think it's very difficult to disaggregate the reasons why they are drawn in. And as you mentioned, Professor Penske, they are, they are sometimes forcibly drawn in. And in other instances, they're drawn in for reasons that are you know, things that draw a lot of us to a lot of things. In the case of gangs, for instance, there are many gangs whose origins are sports teams, for instance. Um, and in the case of the MS-13, there is certainly a grand attraction to the MS-13 because of the type of music that they listen to, the drugs that they do or have access to, you know, those, uh, you know, maybe maybe the, the parties they can access, um, you know, so there, there's, a, there's a huge social component to this that, that is, you know, often very, very much mixed with the economic needs that, that comes with this idea of, of recruitment. And as you rightly point out, point out, you know, we're talking about recruitment. Um, and yeah, sometimes it is very active recruitment. And sometimes it's very much willingly handing themselves over to these gangs. And oftentimes, the reasons for which they're, they're doing that in the case of the MS-13, for instance, is because they're actually looking for protection from that, that particular group. It, it, it allows them, what's the best protection against that group? Well, be part of that group. Um, and so you, you get a lot of that as well. So there's just a huge range of motivations. It's very hard to disaggregate. There's, there's a, a, you know, just a sort of mishmash of a lot of different things. And the motivations over time may also change. They also shift. Um, so it's not necessarily uh, a completely static, you know, question as it relates to recruitment. You know, you may enter for one reason and stay for another. Uh, you know, in the case of the, the MS-13, for example, what you see is that these um, the the membership can allow you to these academic uh, uh, economic resources, so you can help out your family in different ways, and then this links to you know some of the things that Achaleke was talking about, which has to do with how do you fulfill your role as a man, you know your sort of traditional masculine role in these spaces where other avenues are cut off. Well, you, you, you do that by going into these other readily available communities. Um, and we don't think of them or talk about them as such, but they are communities. And, and so that, that's, what, that's what we see, I think, in, in the case of the MS-13, this kind of, you know, very, you know, sort of wide variety of, of motives. But at the end of the day, you're entering into a community. And very often this community, you think of it as a community that can even protect you and protect you not just from that gang or maybe a rival gang, but also uh, very abusive authorities that um, are in your area as well. I mean, it's not, ex it's not as though the state um, or the representatives of the state, most often in the form of police, are doing things that are favorable to, to your community. What they represent is often another kind of um, aggressive or aggressor that you're trying to keep at bay. So, so there's a lot of elements to this notion of, of protection that combine with this notion of how to fulfill your masculinity. And then also this question of being part of this community and a very tight knit community at that. Cesar, I'd like to follow up on, on some of the things that um, both Stephen and Shelley mentioned. Stephen mentioned that he has done some work in, um, or done quite a lot of work in Colombia and Guatemala, which are two countries that you are very familiar with. Um, and Shelley made mention to how the, the manner in which um, children are recruited shouldn't be the key issue. It's the fact that adults are exploiting children um, that, that should be our priority. And I'm wondering if you could talk about your experience um, as a public prosecutor in Colombia, um, as part of the International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala, to what, to what extent did you see and how did you see the issue of recruiting and utilizing and exploiting children to be part of the, the legal 
um, conversation and how was it addressed in those contexts? Thank you very much. First and foremost, thank you for inviting me. Uh, good morning to my audience. Uh, regarding this uh, legal issue, as you stated it, we must start off from a more historical context. We all understand that there are huge uh, international uh, uh, conventions uh, um, in the in the uh, Convention for the Rights uh, for Human Rights, uh, uh, where there are instruments for the protection of rights and all states have the obligation to protect the rights of persons, especially of children, so that children can grow without any obstacles, so that they can grow in uh, peace without uh, uh, a violation to their rights or in, in full uh, use of their right as children. All of these instruments uh, in the United Nations that make reference to the rights of uh, the fundamental rights of children, which are fundamental rights of uh, children that are ratified by the United Nations members uh, saying that children must be away from uh, conflict, all kinds of conflicts, not only internal, but also international conflicts. There are other elements uh, and international el instruments that, that protect against uh, discrimination, that protect women uh, because of their gender, that protect indigenous persons and peasants. So making reference to this, uh, the displaced persons are usually those who are more subject to recruitment by criminal organizations. But, so we must bear in mind something that is very important here. How do they economically uh, are uh, sustained these organizations that uh, allow them to exist and that allow them to uh, maintain or sustain these uh, members? Uh, in Colombia, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and many others, uh, illegal trafficking of cocaine has a really important uh, uh, role to play. So the role of states must be to tackle the sources of uh, income of criminal organizations that will not allow them to uh, exist. If we are able to um, tackle their sources of income, from uh, smuggling, extortion, and uh, illegal uh, exploitation of mining, uh, migrant smuggling, and so on. This would be a great uh, contribution to limiting the existence of criminal groups. Every criminal group that uh, states can eliminate will minimize the possibility of recruitment of children to be part of these criminal groups. So now allow me to give you an example as to why the uh, CICIG in Guatemala that I was a member of for 11, I say, if you don't know this organization, the uh, International Commission for the Prevention of uh, Impunity in Guatemala was a uh, joint venture between the Guatemalan government and the UN uh, to identify these criminal organizations and to fight against them to recover the uh, to recover human rights and especially to fight against impunity. Unfortunately, Guatemala and Central American countries in the, uh, uh, with the exception of uh, Costa Rica perhaps have great, great levels of uh, corruption and impunity as a result of an international study of uh, on corruption. Guatemala, for example, can be located in uh, uh, found as 149 out of 192 uh, countries and the country and Colombia is 92 in the same number of countries with uh, chilling levels of corruption. These are levels of corruption that at some point should understand how corruption in states is an ingredient which is a contribution to the causes that the, the previous panelists mentioned as to what are the elements that lead to the recruitment of children to criminal groups. We also need to consider the decisions made at those moments uh, uh, by local control groups that control the territory in the, so many areas in the North and South, um, in North and South America that decide what is done or not done over the orders of the state in Guatemala. When we did some research to support the state of Guatemala, 
and something that's important to highlight is uh, what the mission of the commission was and the positive effect it had on the in the fight against impunity and the fight against corruption, especially in telling Guatemalans you have rights, you have the ability to demand your rights and the state of Guatemala has the obligation to respond to your population and guarantee the rights of the uh, inhabitants of your court, uh, country. The pressure was so great uh, through research done uh, as a result of international conventions uh, uh, on internally in Guatemala that uh, in the end of the state of Guatemala abruptly decided to decide the mission to end the mission of the committee because the commission was just uh, uh, responding to his mission and they said that they uh, that the commission was uh, acting against the rights of some sectors of the society. So this is just an example of how we were able to legally affect the situation to prevent uh, the uh, in, when uh, children were affected. We also did some research in Guatemala because uh, we found uh, uh, one random morning the heads, uh, the decapitated heads of victims throughout seven different parts of the uh, city of Guatemala. And uh, the bodies weren't found, only the heads. This was a message from the Mara Salvatrucha because they had the penitentiary system had taken some actions in uh, the um, jails uh, uh, separating gang members. These were persons that were randomly abducted off the streets and uh, decapitated. Uh, within this uh, investigation, we found a boy who was 14 at the time, and he said, I want to cooperate in the uh, investigation. And he started telling us how he was recruited into the gang, into the Mara. He said uh, his parents were already members of the gang of the Mara. He was uh, uh, he inducted into the gang at four years of age by delivering messages to neighbors uh, and uh, by taking them uh, cell phones with messages. And that is how he was uh, uh, inducted into the uh, gang activities. And then, then he uh, had to go through horrible uh, beatings as part of the induction uh, uh, ceremonies into the gang. Uh, he also participated in uh, um, abducting some uh, children and he had to bury the bodies of people who were uh, uh, killed by the gang. So he said, okay, so you have so many heads, you have found so many bodies, but you're missing a body. But I will take you to the mass grave where the body is found. Indeed, we went there and we found the body belonging to that head. Thank you, Cesar, I'm going to interrupt you. Examples illustrating the importance of our conversation um, around prevention so that we don't reach the point where we have so many of these kinds of very um, brutal examples. Uh, Max, I think you had a question. Uh, well, uh, I have plenty, but let me see. If, uh, thank you, Cesar. I have. I mean, what the, your intervention has just raised so many, uh, so many different questions that I, I hope we have time to get to them all. I just wanted to circle back uh, to one of the things, Cesar, that you that you said at the very beginning, which is the idea of um, addressing the problem of child recruitment to the gangs by addressing the, as it were, the lifeblood of the gangs, which is how they, how they fund themselves, how they make, how they, how they support themselves. And um, I think, so basically a quest, a comment and then a question, which is di directed to, to all four of you really. The, the comment I suppose is, um, uh, we brought all four of you here together because we've been struck by uh, how difficult it can sometimes be to make meaningful distinctions between armed rebel groups, let's say, as, uh, as uh, recruiters of, of child soldiers in this sort of classical image that I think a lot of us have, um, much of which is drawn uh, from, um, from uh, sub, sub Saharan Africa, um, versus criminal gangs, um, uh, which uh, for most of us uh, evokes a very different image. 
uh, which is, I think, typified by, by a group like the MS-13. But in point of fact, um, the, the difference between a criminal gang and, and an armed rebel group can often be very hard to tell when you think about how these organizations engage in regular crime, kidnapping, murder for hire, human trafficking, illegal mining, uh, drug trafficking of, above all, uh, in order to fund themselves. So one of the things I wanted to ask uh, all of us is how you think or how you think we should think about uh, the, the distinctions between, let's say, armed rebel groups as recruiters of children versus criminal gangs as recruiters of children, and what you think of Cesar's idea that in some sense, we have to follow the money. We have to find ways of identifying and disrupting the flows of revenues into these kinds of groups. And I'll just leave it open to anybody who wants to, to address that question first. Don't make me call on you. I'll start. I just worry that I talk too much. So uh, <laughs> I'd be really interested to hear from especially Akaleki and uh, Steve on this one. But I'll very quickly say that I think that that's a really important point is where the money flow, um, whether it's an armed conflict or an internal criminal uh, network and gang, um, somebody's benefiting financially from it. And oftentimes when you dig deeper down into the corporations as well as uh, the political um, influences, I could talk to you, you know, about the Democratic Republic of the Congo as one of the greatest examples of that. Um, high rates of uh, sexual violence and rape that are very much tied to um, mining uh, industry areas and um, that direct link into um, corporations that are in US and Canada and uh, Europe. Um, and so, and a lot of times those mining corporations are also um, using child labor um, to, to guard the mines or to do some, um, some other activity around there. So I think like that, that's very important. There's also a lot of uh, dynamics to look at in terms of um, we've we've looked at this in Somalia piracy uh, gangs um, linking with uh, how does that differentiate between the kids that are used for um, by Al Shabaab? So you see a lot of uh, the challenges are that there's similar skill sets that might be needed by those groups across um, you know across those groups by children. And so um, if Akaleki talks about the stigma, for example, well, if you have a stigma that you can't get back into um, society, what might be deemed regular society or access to education, and therefore the avenue is, well, I have a skill set that that particular criminal network could use, well, then that's where you're, you may be prone to go. And we've seen that um, in places like Sierra Leone as well, through things like um, motorcycle taxis and communities that were built after the war of all kinds of young people who couldn't find a way to integrate into society or be accepted. And so that is an important element for us to, to understand. Um, but again, I'm going to emphasize from the perspective of someone who's advocating on behalf of preventing this issue with children is that what is really important for us is to see this through the lens of children. How is it that children get um, drawn in? What is the worldview that they see? And it, I think part of our problem is we make these distinctions of these groups because that's what can make us comfortable for how we deal with these things. And we need to get a bit uncomfortable and realize that we all have a role to play, whether it's companies we support, the places that we um, go to, all of those dynamics, the, the government policies. And so, um, yeah, from my perspective, I think that that's a super important area for us to get into. Thank you. Steve, do you want to follow up or Akaletke, do you want to follow up on that? Um, <clears throat> I would just make uh, uh, three three quick points on this. Uh, one is that there is the, the, the children that are brought into rebel groups um, especially when I was doing work in Colombia, such as the FARC or, or the ELN, longtime insurgent groups have a in, like completely different, you know, 180 different experience than a child recruit that we talk about with the MS-13. These are completely different organizations, different structures, 
different disciplines, different geography, um, different modus operandi. These are completely different experiences. So, you know, they, there may be similar motivations that we talked about before. And, and Dr. Whitman also mentioned some of those motivations, of course, but there, there is a completely different experience that occurs there. Um, and I think the motivations are, are also different, you know, including more ideological motivations, perhaps on the insurgency side, more familial ties. You know, there, there is, a, you know, longstanding revenge factors that play into this. So, you know, as Dr. Rubai pointed out, displacement and other things like that. Um, and Dr. Whitman also talked about that, that idea. So that, that's the first thing. The second thing is in, in something like the MS-13, for me, the first social organizing principle uh, is, is social. And the second organizing principle is criminal. Um, and I think that's, that's hugely important as we're considering this because the gang is a rudimentary hand to mouth criminal organization. There are a finite number of members in, in the thousands of members of that gang that make any substantial amount of money. And when I say substantial amount of money, I'm talking about six, six figures, okay? They are moving around chunks of money in the hundreds of dollars that they're sending via Western Union and other rudimentary forms or via telephone services, you know, cellular services, whatever. This, this is a rudimentary hand to mouth criminal organization. The motivations for being part of this are very often linked to criminal activities, most notably violence. But violence is a cohesive, it's, 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 a, it's a thing that, that binds the group together as one, you know, and this is, this is something that helps form this cohesive group, these acts, these collective acts of violence. And yes, in some instances, they do have economic motivations but they are, they are motivated to connect in this, in this other way. So you've got, these, you've got these two elements. I said I had three points, but really I'll just, I'll just leave it there and, and, and let somebody else jump in. But those are, those are super important points. Thank you. Like, let me just say one more thing, just one yeah. more thing on this. This whole notion of going after the money, I couldn't agree with Cesar more. In terms of going after criminal, sophisticated criminal organizations, go after the money for sure. Um, but in these cases where the money is largely, it's not secondary, but it's not the primary motivating factor that links them. That's why the gang is so resistant to destruction is because their motivating factor, their cohesion is not based on whether or not they have any particular business going forward. That's what it's not based, it's not based on that. It's based on social factors. They are a community, a perverse community, a violent community, but a community nonetheless. Thank, thank you very much, Steve, for that. And and Akaleke, I'd love to hear you you uh, 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 weigh in on that issue. I know that you were having some audio difficulties now, so if you can hear us and if you're able to follow along, uh, yeah, uh, um, if you could ro uh, uh, join in to what uh, Shelley and Steve just said, and after that, we'd love to hear from Cesar. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I just want to follow suit with uh, uh, what Steve was talking about, the whole you know, community aspect, what actually bonds people together. Uh, from my experience, I think that in, in a typical African context, which I've had experience to work in, um, the Boko Haram context, separatist fighters context in my country, and local criminal groups in my country, I, I realized that, that there's a very thin line uh, from moving from uh, these typical uh, cr criminal group into uh, participating full time as a soldier in an armed conflict. I take, for example, um, several of the young people from within my community who finally joined or are leading these groups. These were persons who had a history already around, you know, local crime and all of that. So there's a huge connection. You know, it's, it's just like lie telling. When you tell the first lie, you can tell the second lie is very easy. And sometimes the recruiters, you know, rely on this when it comes to, you know, radicalizing or recruiting the children. They go back to. Okay. Because they have the issue of economic, uh, economic motivation. 
I, I feel that just like Steve said, at the end of from this track and uh, 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 you know financing of these groups, you know it brings us back to what we are seeing now in our context. Okay, we're obviously having some you know, connection. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, uh, you're, you, we're having some connectivity issues, so let, let's okay. um, let's. Let, but please finish uh, finish your point, and then and then we'll, we'll yes. We'll hope that we, we get some more bandwidth of uh, as we go. Yes. So I, I, I was trying to say that just like Steve said, you know, a lot of the persons initially the thing is around generating income, but very few people benefit from this. My experience of speaking with and working with some of these young people, be it from Boko Haram or from the armed group, is that at the end of the day, they go home with nothing, yeah. you know, especially the children. And a very little group of people who are usually adults are the ones who benefit from this. You, you, you get the point. And at the end of the day, at the moment where, you know, uh, they try to prevent, you know, financing, maybe from abroad, they turn to, you know, kidnapping and harassing to, to be able to generate income. So, I mean, it brings us back to the issue of, you know, prevention and prevention, because it's very, very important. They will always look for ways to generate income to finance their actions, you know, but it's very important that we try to cut this, you know, right from the roots. It's very important. Thank you. So I'd like to ask a question again of all, this time of all four of you. Um, drawing on some of the things that have been said, we're talking about, some of the kind of top-down changes that would need to be made to address, um, you know, the economic interests, the corruption, um, the the mining and drug trafficking, um, as well as UN in, um, instruments that Cesar was mentioning. But Shelley pointed out, and I think it's important that we come back to. Ultimately, we have to think about this from the perspective of the children. And so, all of you have worked with children, some who have been pulled in to these. Um, networks, these criminal organizations, um, and some who have managed to avoid that. Um, and, and Akaleke in particular continues to work with, with young people, with children to keep them from going down that path. But I'm curious if you could each share, so we, before we switch to um, questions from the audience, we end on, a, we have this section of the, of the webinar finished with a little more positive note. Some of the stories of how children have been effective in resisting the pressures to pull in, whether for economic or social um, reasons. Um, and if I'd like to hear, you know, at least an example from each of you uh, from from your own experiences of, of what you've what you've seen from children. Anyone want to start us off? I'll start. Okay. <laughs> um, just for the sake of time. I think um, one of the things I just did want to highlight was that um, Steve said and um, Ekaliki pointed out too is one of the strong areas that we have seen is um, a sense of belonging is a really important part to to young people. So I think that if that sense of belonging is uh, and, and purpose comes from the points that Steve mentioned, it's possible uh, um, that that is their sense of belonging. But one of the, the things that I have heard most is that when a young person has one adult in their life, it doesn't matter if it's a teacher, a religious leader, um, a distant relative, whoever, who believes in them and provides guidance and support, that's one of the greatest factors to prevent them from being recruited and, and used. And so um, those opportunities that we can provide that in young people's lives uh, is very, very Im important. And so um, I know uh, very specifically that um, there is a great study done in northern Nigeria on Boko Haram, and that was actually one at the heart of it was that Boko Haram was giving out these microcredit loans to young people in the communities to help them start their own businesses as a way to incentivize um, also their membership with Boko Haram. And so it was a small amount of money, as Steve was talking about, but an important piece to someone demonstrating a belief in that person. Now, the young people who resisted taking that, it's because someone else in their life had actually 
told them this was not a good idea and who's someone who they had trust and belief in. So there are um, elements of that. And one other example I'll give is in um, Northern Uganda, when the older brothers started to come back home, um, who had managed to escape and who had left the Lord's Resistance Army and went back into Northern Uganda, um, there's a great study that was uh, done on this also about uh, the levels of recruitment went down significantly because the older brothers were coming home and telling the younger brothers and cousins how to avoid recruitment. And so when we have actual examples of imparting that information because the they realize it's a negative pathway and here's the lessons you can learn. That's some great examples of what we can actually do to help prevent from a very tangible community perspective. Great. Stephen, maybe do you have some examples and then Cesar and Akaleke? Uh, just very, very quickly, because I think Akaleke is, you know, obviously the best position for this. But the, 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 the person who's at the center of my book is a guy called Norman and, and about the MS-13. And, and half of Norman's family enters the gang. And the other half of Norman's family does not enter the gang. You know, how, how do we explain these things? Well, obviously it's, it's very difficult, but you know, in terms of commonalities of gang members themselves, what I definitely saw in, saw in terms of resistance was what Dr. Whitman was talking about, this idea of some sort of family structure, adult mentor, role model, those sorts of things. But also they all had some, some sort of commonality in terms of suffering in the house, very often victims of domestic or sexual abuse. So in terms of interventions, I would think that it's very important to put resources towards early family intervention, early family social intervention of some sort. And then the other thing is about communities. I think that there are alternative communities that you need to create that have to compete with the gang and the armed group communities. Those alternative communities also need resources. Very often it comes via the church in the situation of the gangs, but there are other alternative communities that can be created and I'll leave it there. Great, maybe Cesar, if, if you have some examples and then I think Achaleke, your organization is a perfect example of one of those alternative communities. So we'll go to that after. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Let's, okay. let me, let's okay. hear from Cesar for a moment and then we'll come to you, Achaleke. I think it's extremely important that there is a coordination, complete coordination between the government and local communities so that the plans designed by governments which are quite generous, for example, in Colombia, the Colombian plans are quite important and good. So how these plans get implemented among specific communities so that there will be real benefit there is also some trust in that the plans by the government are really le good and legitimate long uh, lasting proposals. International governments are richest, countries support poorer countries generating resources in order to invest, but there should be some sort of controls, checks and balances so that you can invest resources and not lose opportunities for prevention to remove children from conflicts. If you use examples in Colombia, cocaine crops, the government has a crop substitution program after the peace agreements with the FARC, 99,000 families said they wanted to substitute their crops. However, you need to have some specific substitution proposal that could benefit pa families immediately and the short and the long term. Why? And Dr. Acelli was talking about the potato sacks that the mothers could take thinking that these were children. If a Colombian farmer has coke, he has guaranteed prices is paid by the drug traffickers. But if they cultivate potatoes, they can't sell it. Let, I will give you an example from less than two months ago, 120 pounds of potatoes in Colombia were less than $10. If you figure out the benefit, then you see the complexity. Therefore, these plans must be done with serious politics, with commitment by institutions that is clear and in consultation with communities. Communities must be part of their own solutions. Children must be 
uh, also part of these proposals and of solutions to the problems and circumstances that uh, they're in uh, that uh, lead them to join criminal networks. If we don't consult with the victims, which are children, then we don't know the main source of information in order to face the situation. That's uh, the first point. Second point, there is a great expectation and a great hope in Colombia with the implementation of the peace process. If we're able to make the country peaceful, then we will have more hope for children. Children will regain hope. And if there is no peace, children will continue to be victims of our internal conflict. You all know this, you're all experts. Colombia has been one of the countries in the world who has had the longest internal conflict over 60 years. This is not just conflict with subversive groups, but they are, if they are subversive groups, because if these are organizations that uh, live off of uh, kidnapping, killing and extortion, then I don't think we can call them anything as a political identity. We cannot uh, say they're political groups that are looking for change. And before the government in the Palermo Convention, which is the convention on against criminal organizations, what we understand as such, we need to differentiate it. That's a very fine line between non-criminal organizations or other groups that are outside the law. Okay, we've heard about the importance of a sense of belonging, early family interventions, alternative communities, um, how policies are implemented at the local level, giving children a sense of hope. You, how do you pull all that together in the organization that, that you um, are, are leading in Cameroon to try to keep children and, and to effectively keep children out of these kinds of violence? Um, thank you very much. <clears throat> for, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm very happy about this question because usually uh, we put a lot of energy identifying children who found themselves in this group. We don't talk about the over 95% who uh, do not show interest even when they are faced with the same problems. I mean, um, one of the things that we understood in a typical Boko Haram case in the Fano region of the country is that children were, were being preyed on continuously. You know, despite several efforts to, to prevent this, but it was still happening because of the different social structure that, we, that they had. But we came to understand that uh, the investment around preventing children uh, from being radicalized or recruited, you know, had some aspects which they were missing, which includes giving back children uh, their sense of belonging, for example, in a more innovative way coming from their peers. You know, our approach is a peer-to-peer -peer kind of approach where in speaking to children, we also bring young people or children with whom they can connect, where they can have role models. Because in a typical scenario in an impoverished community, usually these children grow up without looking at people that they can look up to. This contributes to reducing their self-esteem. This contributes to making even their parents not being able to take care of them properly in view of another person that they have seen. And that's why in our model, we develop an initiative called the Salam Initiative. Now, this idea was to target specifically children, young girls, many of whom have been recruited by Boko Haram before, or those who are more exposed to Boko Haram, who have lost parents, who have every reason, you know, to be part of the armed group, but we try to prevent them. Today, we are proud to say we have 120 of them, whom for the past two years, we have not had any case of any of them being recruited, but we have successfully transformed those who were in pain, those who were in fear, those who were in agony through very simple and low costly process. I mean, this is an initiative which we started with, you know, a per diem, which I traveled to the US for a conference I was giving per diem and I went to a Dollar Tree shop and I bought books and pens and I said, we need to start this program for these children. Many of them could not smile. They didn't know what it means to dance. They had never seen a computer before. They were ready to be recruited at any time, but, we focus on not just teaching them A, B, C, no. We focus on building back their self-esteem by connecting them with their peers, you know, from different uh, uh, contexts. We focus on bringing back their childhood, games, exercises, you know, dancing, teaching them how to cook and many other things. And going back to their core skills because this extremist group comes to tap into 
children who have leadership values, you know, for them to lead these armed groups. So we tell them, you know, if you are able to, you know, portray this kind of skills, we could use it for something else, which is good, you know? So our approach has mostly been around, you know, responding to their mental health, one-on-one -on -one talking with them every day. And uh, last year, we we're proud to have 20 of them successfully graduating from our program. And we were able to uh, get some support for them to have a scholarship to go back into formal education. Now, this is a clear example of how we've seen children who are at the crossroad of radicalization, whom have seen some of their peers you know, found themselves there, but we were able to prevent them. Very challenging because the context itself, you know, pushes young girls, you know, at the line, makes them feel, you know, they are not worth it, makes them feel as they grow up, their, their role is going to be on in the kitchen, makes them feel their role is not going to be, you know, to give back to children. But we have been able to change this dynamic. And I think what really worked was the fact that it was done by young people with whom they identify themselves, people with whom they share the same challenges where they can say, oh, if you are talking to me about, you know, not going into violence, whereas we are facing the same problem, we are in the same context. It means, you know, getting into trouble or into armed group is not the right thing to do. So, I mean, this approach is really working and continuously we are seeing how this movement is growing. And even in the English speaking region, uh, we are hoping to start up a similar kind of initiative to work with children who have been internally displaced because usually these armed groups focus on such children who have gone through trauma within their period of war and they capitalize on that. The ones who have anger, you know, the ones who have been victims of the propaganda about, oh, it's government who's doing what, who's causing what is happening to you and they want you to pay back because they are young, they are very docile. It is easy to twist them. So we had to bring a counter twist and today these kids have been uh, free from, from radicalization and it's working very perfectly so far. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. So let's turn to some audience questions now. And um, for uh, I'm, I'm going to combine, I think, three. Uh -huh. I think I'm going to combine three questions uh, and ask uh, uh, the, the panelists to, dis uh, to discuss some, some emerging possible actors uh, in, in prevention efforts. Uh, two of the questions have to do with education. Uh, uh, we, we've heard from Dalton Carter, who's a cadet at West Point as well as uh, Luis Barbazangas, who is a research assistant at, at GRIP in Brussel, Brussels. Uh, and they're both asking if, if you could comment on the role of schools and education in the prevention and recruitment and use of children. Do you think that access to education is a crucial element in the prevention of recruitment? And, and if so, how can, that, how can that access be protected at the, at the minimum or widened at the maximum? And I have another question along with that from an anonymous attendee who asks, do you think militias use religion as a tool to brainwash children and their families and promote child soldiering? And how could religious leaders also play a role in prevention? And I, I'm, I'm reminded very much of, of some parts of, of Steve's book on MS-13 about that. So, so one question about, about the role of educational uh, opportunities and institutions, and one question about both the, the negative and the potentially uh, preventive roles of, of churches and of religion. Floor is open. Okay, I'll begin again. <laughs> um, very quickly, education is it really important, um, of course. Um, access to education, we know there's a lot of places where education is not free. Um, and so therefore that's a major challenge. We also have a lot of areas where education um, is something that can only be reached until a certain level, you know, primary level. And then after that, it becomes really challenging because of economic uh, pressures, et cetera. So I think that's uh, one aspect that is very important. But I wanted to also emphasize that I think one of the things, even when children do have access to education, is what is being taught. And so um, we know that there are many uh, traditional kind of education systems built off of this colonial approach to, uh, to bringing education to many of the areas in which there is um, 
still conflict occurring, which are not in keeping with the current needs of the community and the people and things like peace education are really important um, aspects on reconciliation and an understanding of, of others, etc. So we don't do enough of that. And we don't do enough on critical thinking. And so when we fail to do that, we fail to be able to help our children to be able to see the distinction between um, the kind of propaganda or lies that, you know, Akaleki was talking about um, and distinguishing and making, making um, efforts to take, take different paths. That's a really important point that we have to address. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that um, in terms of religion, um, there can be negative and positive absolutely it's been used negatively and positively um, in many different instances but what i know too is that a lot of the places that i have done work in um, oftentimes the religious entities are underutilized in this area of prevention because they too need to be educated about all of the dynamics of this and yet at the same time they often hold a lot of power in communities um, so there's there's an ability to harness that in ways in which we haven't done it enough and some of that is related also to the very fact that um, in Western societies, we've done such the, a distinction between church and state that uh, there's such fear of collaborating a lot of times with the with uh, these organizations and we need to take a step back and say that actually they're a really important basis to many of the societies and how can we harness it positively. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I hello. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yes, uh, I think uh, on the, the whole uh, issue of education, you know, as rightly said, it's about what kind of education and what is being taught. It's very, very important. And in our experience uh, in the far north region of the country, the Salam School, we realized that, you know, different stakeholders were intervening around education as well. But one of the things which uh, we try to do differently was to use uh, our opportunity to educate these children differently and to use a more innovative and child-centered approach. Uh, because we realized that at the same time when we are having the conflict, the state was working so hard to set up schools and others for people to go to school. But it was not just about children to go to school. It's about how do we also at the same time respond to the different challenges that these kids or the children are going through while going to school. I, I take for example, issues around mental health and psychosocial support were not very considered, you know, in these efforts for, you know, for education. So if we're looking at education to prevent, we need to be very innovative. In our context, we focus around, you know, uh, role play, games and exercises to invite in these children what mediation is all about, to invite in them what peace is all about, to, to give them a sense of what dialogue looks like. Because we're in a context which is very patriarchal, where you know, uh, the aging class feel that, you know, there's an African problem, which is said, if, 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 uh, if, 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 an, if, if a young man sees something while standing up, you know, an old man will see even much more for that even while sitting down, you know, already making a younger person feel uh, uh, that your role is very limited. And this is how children have grown. And, and this is the kind of narrative which, you know, extremist groups use to radicalize. So our approach is going back to this core values these core issues around children morals ethics the value of life because you know education now we focus on just the abc the maths the english without looking at touching the core values ethics morals you know what makes you a human you know that that humanity part of it and this has been our focus around education hoping that we can do education in times of conflict very differently in a way where children will learn the kind of skills where they will not repeat the same things which their elders, you know, found themselves in. Now, on the in, the in the aspect of religion, I feel that religious leaders are very instrumental, especially in a context where the the violence is religiously motivated. I take the case of Boko Haram, for example, where these groups perpetually talk about the Quran, for example, they use it wrongly. The role of the religious leaders is to be able to right these wrongs and give the proper narratives. And that's why they are very important because 
uh, they have a strong mastery of the population of the people, and they are seen at the, as the mouthpiece. They are very important. But at the same time, if you go down to the English speaking part of the country, some of these religious leaders at the same time are losing legitimacy because of the issue that the conflict is between the state and the group of people. And it is easy for a religious authority to lose his legitimacy when he's talking about peace or when it's seen that he wants to fight with the state. And that's why it comes back to the issue that we need to school them properly. They need to be incapacitated. And several instances we've been doing, you know, inter-religious and intergenerational dialogue with traditional authorities and young people and children and communities so that we also build their capacity so that they should be a proper mouthpiece and do not find themselves in political conversation or taking sides. I mean, it's good, but if it's not properly looked at, it could be a danger at the same time. Okay, thank you. Cesar or Steve? Cesar, quieres hablar? Sí, gracias. Dale. Well, yeah, hey. thank you. In terms of religion or education rather, of course, this is a very important element in order to try and strengthen the values in children so that children can believe in themselves so that they have more tools to protect themselves. The difficulties we see in South and Central America is the quality of education provided. They just give them classes, but they don't think of, for example, in Guatemala, those who were named as teacher had been the students that had re recently graduated from basic intermediate education. They had no experience in teaching and they had no training. So we saw that the schools were completely destroyed and children had to bring their own little seat so they can uh, be in school and sit down. And if it was raining, they had to move around so they won't get wet. It's important to remember that when there's conflict, there is no freedom. Even if children or teachers want to have classes and have uh, uh, classes of value and uh, knowledge because the leaders of intellectual groups uh, set the rules and have conditions. But if a teacher is trying to teach differently from what these groups want and the teacher becomes a victim of threats or are killed if necessary. And if they don't listen to the recommendation or rather orders given by the uh, territorial leaders of that area. So also sometimes education becomes politicized and that happens in Colombia since we had the peace agreements when we had consulta the consultation process to uh, approve or not the peace agreements, almost 50% voted yes and 50% voted no. So it has been politicized and the state has politicized education. So that's how you guide what you can say or not say in schools. In terms of religion, you would think that should be a very important factor in strengthening and uh, uh, removing the children from becoming uh, victims of territorial groups. However, unfortunately, that's not what happens. If I may give you an example of a case that I read yesterday of the International Criminal Court, there was a sentence which will provoke a lot of debate, I'm sure, in the international community. There was a armed group from the God's resistant army in Rwanda when Dominic Ajin was uh, sentenced to 30 years in prison by 61 crimes against all humanity with 4,000 victims. Why will this case provoke debate? Because this young man, when he was 11 years old, was recruited, forcedly recruited by this rebel group, which had a religious uh, basis. So he was in that group since he was 11. This week, he was sentenced. So there is debate. Is this person, was he uh, someone who joined the group freely and voluntarily, or was he forced? And they raised him to become a machine of killings and deaths, because that's what they usually did in refugee uh, in camps killing people and recruiting children to be part of the group. The court said that this person was completely capable and had decided to execute people and 
include children and commit crimes against humanities when he was of age and he could freely have left or not left the organization uh, and decided to stay in that resistant God army in Uganda. But this is debatable, I think, and it will be debated in the human right groups because that is an important sentence just like the first sentence the court has published where a sentenced a leader from a rebels in Congo to 14 years in prison for recruiting children. So we have both extreme. The first sentence has been because someone recruited children, but the last sentence by the court, they condemn a child that had been recruited because of what he did afterwards. And the reason I say this is because the group he belonged to was the religious group. And with all due respect, we have to remember that throughout history, many international and national conflicts have started on, ba on the basis of a religious religion. This is a chance to jump in here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, please go uh, ahead. Well, I, I guess my feeling about this is is multiple on multiple levels, I guess, in the very macro sense, of course, education, you know, we always talk about it, it is this kind of way to it's, it's an avenue for social mobility, right? I mean, that's the way that we're taught to think about it in the United States, an avenue of social mobility. The reality is, is because of these kind of I, what I would call almost savage capitalist systems, and neoliberal policies that have been really hoisted on many, many countries that have these issues, this is not a priority. You know, this is, this is the lowest priority. So it doesn't get the resources that it needs on the macro level. So it's hard to talk about it from, you know, a sort of perspective of, you know, of this issue of recruitment into armed groups when the larger structural systemic issue is never properly approached. It's never properly approached broached at all. Uh, now, on the micro level, of course, education can, can offer that possibility of, you know, this avenue of social mobility. Terrific, in the best of circumstances. And in other ways, it certainly can, can provide other things, you know, uh, what has been, you know, what Achaleke was talking about, and what Dr. Whitman was referring to, these kind of um, resistance techniques, if you will you know, negotiations or dialogue or whatever you want to call it, you know, or conflict resolution, you know, there's, there's that aspect of it. Um, it can be, it can be a safe space, um, you know, maybe one of the only safe spaces because people get, they get beat up in their home and they get beat up if they're on the street, but if they're in school, maybe they're safe. So it can be a safe, one of the only safe places. Um, and it can have these alternative communities that I think are so important. You know, I think of, you know, I mostly because I was brought up in this environment, I think of sports teams and things of that sort. But there are many other things, music and youth groups and all the rest that go along with it. They can they can have homes inside of schools, but schools can also be incredible danger zones. If you don't have if you don't have the protection, the infrastructure, the wherewithal um, to deal with things like street gangs, it is a ripe area of abuse. And we have hoisted the teachers on the front lines of this. Um, and sometimes unwittingly, in, in my book, I chronicle the first day of a youth who can't find his classrooms because he doesn't speak English. And what happens? She connects him to another student who speaks Spanish, who can show him his classes. And the other student is an MS-13 member which immediately starts him down this path of being, you know, the other guy tries to recruit him constantly over a three year period and eventually gets him in trouble for it. So th this, is, this is a place where that can be an area, a, a sort of a, a, an area of abuse. Um, and then with regards to the church, yes, the church in the case of the MS-13 has represented one of the only avenues of escape. It's worth so much more understanding and study. And I think it, it's, it's important because it's one of the few avenues that the gang accepts. In other words, if you, if you leave the gang via the church, isn't it, it is an acceptable exit. And there aren't a lot of acceptable exits as it relates to the gang. It's basically joining the church 
or getting old and kind of growing out of it. So those are your two ways out. And in the church is, and, and, and this is the double-edged sword about it. The reason the church is, is because it has a very similar structure and ideology as the gang. It's very patriarchal. It's very top down. It's very much about, you know, kind of accepting what is the reality around you. And in, and in oftentimes, and in this, is, this, is, this is the case in the areas that I study, it often is in support of, of these same systems that I was speaking about earlier in the macro sense that engender gangs. So there is no real social change that is happening if you exit a gang, if you, if you exit a gang via church. It is, it is great that you exit a gang via church, but there's no structural changes that result from these affiliations with churches. It's, it's just it deals with that particular instance. So it is for me a kind of double-edged sword. So bu building off of that, Steve, um, and this doesn't address the issue of the structural um, changes that are necessary, but kind of um, adds to the point that you're making. You talk about the church as being a, an institution with a similar structure as the gang, and you all just finished talking about the institutions of education and, and, and churches or religion. Um, we have two questions. Um, that ask us to examine two other institutions which are, are similar to st in structure as the gang and that's the police and the military. Um, and so um, Sam C. Sam, who we, is a friend of ours um, from Tide in South Sudan, um, and Catherine Winkler um, from Nova Scotia Voice for Women both asked questions regarding recruitment um, into the military and into police forces and how in many instances that also occurs at a very young young age um, and that there's there's promoting not necessarily bringing them in but starting to promote the idea of going in that track and being a cadet that ultimately will end up um, in the in a military force um, as they reach adult age. So I'm curious if any of you want to comment on those institutions and how you engage with them to promote prevention. I'll, let, I'll leave that open to whoever, one, whoever wants to take it. So I'm gonna start just because the basis of what we do is oftentimes working with the military and police around the world to instruct them on how to improve their interactions with children, um, as well as be a preventative uh, dynamic that we need to, to take a uh, full, fuller advantage of. So, on the one hand, there's the elements related to the places of conflict that we may be in, and they could be an active recruiter um, of children. And what we need to make sure is that we're working with them so that they understand uh, that this is not just uh, from the perspective of an international legal dynamic, it's also about building peace and security in your country, which should be your main role to help secure and thinking through the consequences of the recruitment and use of children and so we we do that work um and we've been working in places like somalia to south sudan to drc um some work in nigeria etc and we've continuously found that when we open up their eyes to this dynamic from the perspective of children and the and the very honest conversations instead of the finger pointing dynamic how can we talk to you about what this does would you want this for your own children let's think about the consequences of it why are the children involved in the first place that you are interacting with it gets us to a, a point where we're talking about how we can improve the situation, their capacity and ability to deal with their roles um, in, a, in a way that um, is very effective from what we are seeing. But the points related to um, recruitment, cadet schools, all of those kinds of things, I mean, that's a whole other area we could talk about um, that requires a, a different kind of conversation than the one here. But I... I want to stress that while um, I think it's an important conversation to have, if you actually look at the numbers of young people who go through those programs and then are sustained through it into those 
uh, organizations, it's a very low number. Um, it, it's really in, in not very um, important in terms of the larger structure of those militaries. So, um, so because I know that the individual who's asking from Nova Scotia, I saw what was written in there about cadet programs, etc. The numbers are so low. Um, however, I um, do you want to say that um, when we have worked with groups like the Canadian Armed Forces, the British Ar uh, Armed Forces, etc., when you have conversations with them about this issue and you talk to them about the fact that um, children between the ages of 16 and 18 could voluntarily enlist in, as long as there is a legal guardian that um, agrees to it and it they are not sent into combat until they are 18. When you talk about the consequences of those types of things, you will find out that if you sit down with them, they actually start to question it themselves. They start to question, um, is this the right thing for us to be doing? And I think that's an important thing for the institutions that we work with is that we also allow them to come to those some, some of those conclusions too about whether or not this is the best route. Quite honestly, I would tell you that if we are going to have recruitment um, uh, of, of young people in any country, we should probably be aiming for the age of 21 because uh, Technically, in terms of brain science, what we are hearing is that your brain isn't fully uh, developed until you are 21 to make those kinds of uh, decisions when it comes to um, aspects related to, you know, the, your, your um, emotional part of your brain. So I think even 18 is too young for us. Um, and, you know, in the United States, you can't drink until that age. So why would you allow people to join an armed group before that, right? So there's a whole other set of debate to go on in, in, in that regard. I wanted to, to circle, thank you, Charlotte. I wanted to circle back to um, uh, Catherine Winkler uh, has just uh, submitted a, a really great follow-up question. And, and it's something that we were talking about um, in our meeting planning this session. Uh, and, and so I'll just read it out loud and, and have, uh, and really have um, uh, uh, everybody just uh, take a, a brief turn, if you wouldn't mind, is she writes, the importance of gender sensitive reintegration programs to address individual needs has been stressed. However, I don't hear much about the need for gender sensitive prevention, addressing sexual violence and issues of violent masculinities. And she asks all of you to, to speak to that. Shelley, would you mind starting us off and then have? Okay, at the risk of talking too much. Um, it is very important. Actually, it's a really important part to the work that we are doing. Uh, we've got a major uh, research and uh, policy programming project that we're working on in three countries in Africa right now, which uh, is all about the gender dynamics of uh, recruitment and use and prevention. We've got another project where we're working also on on how gender impacts the way that peacekeepers interact with uh, with children who also are being recruited and used. So th there's gender dynamics on both sides. And then you've got um, the very fact that of course, that the organizations you're dealing with um, tend to be created, yes, from a very masculinized perspective. And, and um, uh, of course, the experiences within the armed groups can be very different based on gender also, but um, again, it's a huge, huge aspect. Um, sexual violence is often used as one of the indoctrination um, techniques, and uh, certainly that's um, you know, what's really, uh, you know, additionally horrific is if this is the education that the young people are getting about, um, uh, about gender relations um that can have such long-term consequences we've got children who are born into these groups um, as a result of rape and sexual violence so um, many many dynamics that are important for us to understand and not researched enough um as well as from a programmatic perspective not enough funding put into that differentiation of those elements too yeah um, I, I think on this note, I just I would like to highlight, uh, you know, uh, something which I observed um, some years ago when the chief of uh, girls were kidnapped. Uh, 
And, and I came to understand that, you know, uh, violent extremist groups are, are actually changing the dynamics. Uh, they are actually around radicalization. It's something we should really look at. Uh, because continuously, we'll see that the number of suicide bombers who were men reduced to having more young girls used as suicide bombers. And when we were on the field, in the case of Boko Haram in, 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 in uh, uh, the, uh, the, the far north of the country, we realized that this could only happen because young girls had a soft spot in the community. If you see a young girl within the market space, you would hardly suspect that she is carrying a kamikaze or something, you know, because it's a girl. And they had to focus on this strategy and it explained why many young girls have been kidnapped continuously, you know, by these groups. So it is very important that we look at also this gender, you know, uh, dynamics of how these groups are evolving, you know, focusing on women more, using younger girls, uh, to recruit even men at the same time. We've seen a lot of this happening. So, and in, in, in our experience working with the children in the final region of the country, we saw that young girls were even much more exposed because they played a more strategic role, you know, when it comes to children. And I think this is something which we really need to look at. You know, it happened when the girls were kidnapped, but a lot of, you know, scholars did not really look deep on, on, around this. But being on the field, talking with some of these children, I feel that there's a growing need for us to look at it from a gender lens and try to ensure that even the response, because there are some of these kids who have been sexually violated several times, and it takes a whole different process to be able to heal them. Many of them will not be able to speak out because it's not in our culture, in a typical African culture for you to speak out. We are in a context where you hardly speak out you know, to your father because your dad does not create a space for you to communicate, especially when it comes to a young girl. So already, already your, your, your cultural context prevents you from opening up, making it much more difficult and much more challenging for young girls who have been through this process to even talk about what they are going through. So I think that it comes back to the importance of us looking at it clearly from a gender lens and while developing responses, we need to take this into consideration and see how we can separate, you know, respond sometimes for young boys and young girls. Because I feel that from what we've seen on the field, young girls are becoming even much more exposed and are suffering the most in, in context of, 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 of armed conflict, yeah. Cesar? Si observamos, por ejemplo, a nivel if we take a look at South and Central America, most of the uh, human rights defender groups are led by women, which means that women are the ones that are the hardest fighters and the most aware of the need to respect the human rights, not only of adults, but also of children. In Colombia, the phenomenon of recruitment can be seen, unfortunately, in the number of girls that is unfortunately increasing astrono astronomically. In 2018, the difference between the uh, uh, recruitment of girls and boys was only 10%. The numbers, the areas most affected by this recruitment, unfortunately, is in the poorest areas of the countries, in peasant areas, uh, indigenous areas, and Afro-descendant areas. And as uh, my colleague from Cameroon was saying, girls are used for specific activities that where boys are not used. So especially to satisfy the brutal sexual appetite of recruiters and the heads of criminal organizations. Girls in Colombia are also used to recruit new persons, especially to become uh, the guides uh, to leaders of uh, uh, criminal uh, leaders in some rural areas, especially one of the main issues in the uh, recruitment is uh, specifically, for example, Colombia, it has a very uh, difficult topographic uh, situations. They are, for example, if you know Colombia, you know we have uh, 
uh, beaches on both coasts and which uh, allows uh, which uh, allows people to go on vacation and usually women are abused in these coastal areas and this becomes a good uh, uh, fertile ground for recruiting uh, uh, sex slaves for example this is also seen in South and Central America where education is considered a more for boys and for girls. And it's amazing to see that at this point in history, people still think that girls should be at home. And during this pandemic, uh, uh, and you would think that uh, with this pandemic, the, the girls would be safer, but statistics show that during the pandemic, more girls were exposed. And you can ask yourself why exposed? Well, because they are at home locked up and then recruiters can just go to their homes and just simply take them from their homes to make them a part of those criminal organizations. And when they were in school in the last year, in 2019, there were 13 attacks to schools to recruit mostly girls to make them part of these groups. So as a result, I do believe that it's important to take uh, more streamlined actions to protect young girls who are most exposed and most vulnerable. There's a natural weakness in women vis-a-vis -vis men and their ability to protect, to defend themselves. And we might think that we're all the same, but certainly girls are, women are more exposed physically in these recruitment areas. There are more, more research is desperately needed in this, in this field on this question of, of gender. There, there is no question in my mind it is an understudied aspect of this. Um, in the case of the MS-13, um, you know, the, the gangs are, are absolutely horrendous um, as it relates to their relationship with, with women, with females, and it plays out in horrendous and bloody ways. Um, but I would argue that they are really just the crudest manifestation of the way, in this case, El Salvadoran society and even their legal structures treat women. You know, El Salvador is one of the only places in the world where it's codified that you will be prosecuted for abortion. So the efforts to criminalize uh, or at least monitor from a legal perspective the female body is part and parcel of the country's legal codes. That, that attitude is also uh, writ large the attitude of, of society. And then it's manifest in very crude and bloody ways inside the gang. So the gang is a manifestation of what El Salvador is. It's not a separate or an anomaly inside of that case. It's an example, an extreme example to be sure, but an example. The second thing that I think is very important when considering this is from obviously the perspective of, of the male in this equation. We always think of these things, uh, uh, you know, and, and we do constantly talk about the way that females are victimized because of the patriarchal structure. But in this case, we have to think about it also from the male perspective. And, and just to cite one thing that I looked at, albeit you know, very superficially, and that also warrants a lot more study, and that is how sexual assault and rape impacts uh, the formation uh, or the creation and cohesiveness of these particular criminal gangs inside of those enclosed spaces, such as prisons. Um, the, the need to, to get protection from that close quarters uh, potential assault, um, very often sexual in nature. And that, that the risk of losing what would be considered your, your entire you know, sort of being of masculinity in those spaces you know, is just so great that it creates these very cohesive groups. If there is not, it's not an accident that these groups have in their, in their codes of conduct, no rape. Um, and that many of these prison groups 
succeed in gaining recruits and gaining followers and assistance inside of these spaces because they prohibit rape. Um, and that is an element that is very much understudied as it relates to organized crime and criminal groups, especially inside prisons. And a gang like the MS-13, its epicenter is our, our prisons in, in, in Central America. In the United States, it's slightly different, but in Central America. So those are the two points I would make as it relates to gender. So, Ataleka, did you want to comment on gender? I know you shared an example with us before that was specific to a program on gender. I want to give you a chance before I jump in with, a, with another question. Um, I'm not, nothing specific on that, yeah. Okay, yeah. so this question, you may not, there may not be an answer to it, but I'm interested in your opinions, <laughs> your perspectives, because you have a lot of experience here. Um, it strikes me that, um, and you can also correct me if I'm wrong and I'm, if I have a purely US um, centric um, perspective on this, but it strikes me that at least in the United States, there's a very clear distinction between how people think about um, children engaged in mass violence elsewhere in the world, um, the people recruited into child soldiering, and we have this image of these poor children who deserve our sympathy, we should help them, pre prevent them from being drawn in, help them reintegrate if once they're able to get out, reintegrate into society, versus the attitudes that we have domestically about particularly black and brown children being drawn into gangs at a very young age, also for all the same reasons as we've all been talking about um, throughout this, this conversation, but those don't earn sympathy um, from many people. Instead, they, they uh, are receive a response of this is criminal behavior, it needs to be punished. Um, it's not about reintegration, it's about punishing and correcting it that way. I'm wondering if this is something you have, have observed elsewhere. Is it just generally a domestic criminalization versus an international level of sympathy? Um, or is it a particularly um, uh, US um, perspective? Um, or is it a function simply of um, you know, structural racism in the United States. I'm just, I don't expect you to have the answer so much as your opinions and your perspective on, on this phenomena of sympathizing for some, um, really vifying others. And that's for anyone who wants to take it. Shelly, I think we've established a pattern. I, we can always count <laughs> yeah, on I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, I have talked about this a lot in the past. So anyone who's hearing me speak again will hear that. Yes, I think that um, we think very differently when we classify children who um, are involved in an armed conflict versus children who we would say are associated with a terrorist group. So I think, you know, Ekeleki would say probably similar to kids who are joining Boko Haram are thought of very differently from kids who might be in some other um, type, of, uh, type of group. Um, so I think that's one thing I know in our country, in Canada, that that's certainly different. There seems to be a lot of uh, sympathy um, or empathic feelings towards those who are participating in far off distant conflicts that are internal. Um, but once you start talking about things that are related to ideology, um, the, the, the empathy levels certainly um, go, go down. Um, the other thing I would say is that, um, yes, I, I do think there's a lot of racism in that um, because, you know, I, I'll use the case in Canada with Omar Khadr, um, someone who was of uh, Islamic background who, um, uh, you know, is accused of um, killing an American medic in Afghanistan, who was a child taken by his parents to, uh, to, to uh, madrasas um, and then at the same time, um, you know, this this case had a lot of political dynamics of it because because of the the, the narrative of the war, 
And the way that Canadian society is divided in terms of how it perceives his case, you have those who see him as a child soldier and those who see him as a terrorist, it divides itself along the same lines that you see with um, the division of those who would support Black Lives Matter versus those who would um, be on the white supremacist Proud Boys kind of perspective. And so that like, all of that, that narrative of that is um, something that um, is very important for us to see in terms of the differences of how we have these perceptions of the children based on those different um, affiliations and the treatment, um, whether it's justice, whether it's um, ideas related to um, how, how we would uh, rehabilitate, et cetera, are all very different. Um, so yeah, uh, there, there's, there's so much to unpack there, um, but definitely uh, huge differences in perceptions and treatments and who's to blame, et cetera. Anyone else care to comment on that? Did I scare you all away? I would just say a couple things to this. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to this. I think it's a really great question. Um, and certainly when you deal with things like gangs, you have to face down this question. Um, I, I would posit a possibility, which would be that in part, this has to do with the framing of the issue and the framing of the issue as it relates to insurgencies and armed groups is very often these insurgencies are about collective systemic failures. Um, and so it's just, it's just about the, the system has already been framed as, as failing. And within that system, you have victims. What you have are victims of that system, right? And in the case of the gangs, you don't get that framing. You get it very much focused on the individuals, as you pointed out, and it becomes a question of, you know, it, it gets stripped away of all context. And it's just, what were the acts of violence or criminal activity in which this, per this person participated? And it gets channeled through a very strict kind of judicial structure. The other is getting channeled through you know, demobilization projects and things of that sort. It's a completely different rubric and framing of the issue on the one hand and on the other. And, and you know, when you have this kind of individualistic, um, you know, look, you know, you don't, get, you don't get people taking a step back and saying, well, we have a collective responsibility for this as well. Um, and, and that you just, you just don't have in the gang question at all because it's always framed and in that way and stripped of all context. We're just talking about their specific criminal activities. Thank you. Well, um, folks, we're just about getting to the end of our time here. So I'm going to uh, begin to wrap things up. Um, First of all, uh, thank you so much to our four panelists, to Achilleke Christian Leque, to Steve Dudley, to Shelley Whitman, and to Cesar Rincon for joining us today uh, and sharing their experience and their insights with us. I think it was a great conversation. Uh, there's so much more to talk about, as always is the case in, in these events, but I hope that um, all of us can continue working together and uh, we look forward to the great work that all four of you are going to be doing uh, going forward. Thank you also, by the way, to our two interpreters for their invisible but vital hard work of making sure that, um, that we are able to talk to each other so easily and fluently. Um, thank you, uh, all of you for, in the audience, for joining us today. Um, just a reminder that these, uh, that these webinars are monthly events. Let me tell you a little bit more about what's in store over the next few months. Next month in March, uh, we have uh, a conversation between um, our Carrie Wiggum, who's our assistant professor of genocide and mass atrocity prevention here at uh, Binghamton University, who will be in one-on-one -on -one conversation with Alice uh, Nederitu, the new special advisor of the UN Secretary General for the Prevention of Genocide at the United Nations. Alice is just uh, assumed her position very recently. She has a lot of thoughts and ideas about how uh, that office can be, can be used and improved. And so you'll wanna make sure to join us for that. That is going to be on the 17th 
of March. Um, again, uh, from 10 o'clock until 11.30 a.m. And in April, uh, uh, Nadia Rubai will be uh, uh, holding a session that will focus on indigenous priorities and perspectives in atrocity prevention. Uh, that date has yet to be exactly set, but that will be on our website soon. Please visit the GMAP, uh, the IGMAP website. I have a funny feeling it's going to be popping up in the chats um, any minute now. Uh, please um, uh, go to the IGMAP website for complete information about our webinars, including a link to register for the uh, March conversation with the new UN Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide. Uh, um, uh, and also, uh, if you'd like to uh, learn about our other programs um, uh, and, and events, you can get full um, information there. Uh, uh, also, uh, uh, we've just uh, given you once again the link to the um, to the Dallaire Institute's um, website. Please visit their website as well, as well as Insight Crime, uh, to continue to follow up with um, uh, uh, our panelists and their work. Well, that's it for us. Um, and Nadia, did you want to? Do you have anything else? Okay, that's just it for thank us. You to all the Panelists uh, 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 for this time, we hope to see you again next month. Thank you once again for joining us and goodbye. Thank you very much.